Russian and U.S. sources and, you know, the, the U.S. news sources have just been completely unreliable. And that's not to say that everything that comes out of the other side is reliable either. But everyone seems to agree something happened in Kharkov. But when you look at it in relation to the banana, it's somewhat north and east and something that I wouldn't I'm not surprised to hear the Russians just really didn't defend very stalwart really is that correct well there was no defense at all it was just a screen line there were were no defenses per se and large numbers were as i pointed out very light forces including what we would we would call them swat teams paramilitary police this sort of thing and 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 i think the russians have always tried to run what i would call a limited campaign in other words minimize the numbers of forces that you need and use them, but use them carefully, and minimize the casualties that you you would otherwise take by avoiding direct frontal assaults, maneuver, and maximize the use of firepower. Uh, and that's what's been going on for the last six plus months. So I, I think I think people are confused because they say, "Well, look, why why did they just let that go?" Well, first of all, none of the territory that I talked about before that has ninety five percent of Ukraine's mineral resources, oil, gas, agricultural output, and so forth. None of that is in the vicinity of Kharkov. The reason the Russians will eventually regain control of Kharkov is very simple. Historically, it's a Russian city, not a Ukrainian city, a Russian-speaking city. It always was. The same thing is true for Odessa. Odessa is a Russian city. It was a Russian-speaking city. It always was. Historic Ukraine is much further north and borders on the Dnieper River Valley and a little bit to the east of the Dnieper in the north, up where Kiev is. That's historic Ukraine. So the areas that we're talking about for probably 800 years, 500, 800 years, something like that, were under Mongol Tartar domination. And the Tartar Khanate in Crimea was a tributary state of the Sultan of Turkey. The Russians eventually overwhelmed and threw the Tartars out, largely because the Tartars spent most of their time stealing slaves. In other words, they'd come up and captured large numbers of Slavic children in Russia and Ukraine, and then resell them in the slave markets of Constantinople, or what we call Istanbul. That ended in in 1776, and since 1776, Russia has controlled those areas. And those areas had no large cities or towns or anything in them. Everything that is there now was built under the czars after the the Mongol Tartar forces and Ottoman forces were driven out. So what we see now, I think, is a change in strategy. The Russians have said, well, fine, you refuse to negotiate with us. You refuse to, to terminate this war. Fine, we'll let it run. Russia is not being harmed by sanctions. The Russian economy is actually flourishing largely because it it has everything that everyone in the world needs. And most of this is being sold off to China and other states that are not part of Europe and North America. So if you walk away from Europe and North America, the rest of the world is doing business with Russia. What Russia wants to do, along with China, India, and many other countries, is set up a parallel financial system that, in other words, they want to de-dollarize stop using the dollar. That's a tougher That's a tougher thing to do because those institutions will not spring up overnight. It'll take them several years, but it's underway. And at least on a small scale, and I shouldn't say small because China and India are enormous economies, they're now doing business with the Russians in their own currency. They're not using dollars. And we, we also have seen that the Saudis and the Emirates are willing to do business with the Russians in their currency as opposed to dollars. Remember, the petrodollar is very important to our global financial dominance. So those are all bad trends, but the trends on that side will take longer to work. Right now in Europe, the situation is very grim. I I don't know how much Americans are hearing about what's going on in Germany and France and in the Czech Republic and various countries in Europe, but They've had demonstrations involving hundreds of thousands of people all over the continent demanding an end to support for Ukraine in this war. And we haven't even gotten into the winter yet. And we just had our first snowfall in southern Poland. 
and people are anticipating a cold winter. There are, there are individuals on, in the West saying, oh, well, that's all right. We'll get our energy from Africa. Well, good luck with that. I don't think you're going to see the energy that Russia provides supplanted by very much energy from the Middle East or Africa anytime soon. So I think we're in for extremely rough winter. The, the Germans have already instructed police to prepare plans to deal with unrest over the winter. You're, you have people that are rationing not only energy, they're also going into stores with empty shelves uh, because they're, they're dependent on everything from cooking oil to wheat and other things that come from Russia and white Russia. And those countries aren't shipping anything to the West. So I think the, the Russians can afford to wait right now and take things very slowly as things worsen in Europe. And in the meantime, I think their strategy is to invite the Ukrainian forces, what are left of them, to impale themselves on Russian defenses of the territory that they control. So they're, they're, they are literally bleeding Ukraine white. And this is a kind of interesting development because that's to some extent what happened during World War II. In the last year and a half to two years of World War II, the, Hitler kept insisting on holding every inch of ground, and then he insisted on counterattacking to retake every lost inch of ground. And the combination essentially destroyed the German armed forces, destroyed them logistically, destroyed their manpower. Uh, that's effectively what's happened with Ukraine. So I think the Russians can wait, and by the time they move on Odessa, I don't think there's going to be a great deal of resistance to them on the ground because most of the Ukrainian forces will be destroyed. They'll take Odessa, that turns the rump Ukraine into a landlocked country, and then eventually they'll turn their attention back north again and, and recapture Kharkov. And it, as far as the Russians are co concerned, that's all they're interested in. We, Meanwhile, we keep trying to convince everybody that the Russians, who have relatively small ground forces, are, are interested in attacking the rest of Europe and reconquering Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. It's all nonsense. There's no interest in that at all. If you mentioned that when the Russians believed that there might be a negotiated settlement, would they have been willing to give up any of the territory they had already taken in that settlement, in your opinion? Yes, I think so. They hadn't lost very many people at that point. See, the longer a war lasts, the more blood that is spilled, the more anger, hostility, and hatred grows. Let's be frank. Uh, this is a very obviously the case with the Ukrainians. We had cultivated hatred and hostility to Russia in Ukraine with the government that we helped to install in 2014. That's very clear. But once you start killing large numbers of people in combat, the hatred grows very, very rapidly. And you get into this terrible, terrible situation where you, you say, we've already lost this much. We cannot afford to give anything up. So the more people that die in a particular action, the, the less willingness there is after the action to reach any sort of negotiated settlement. But in the first month, I would say first, really the first six weeks, the Russians were quite serious. And if you go back to April, you'll see that Zelensky actually said publicly that he, he could be comfortable with neutrality. And there was a willingness to give up any further claims to Crimea. Remember, the Russians said, no more claim on Crimea, recognize that it's Russian, grant autonomy or independence to the two republics in, in eastern Ukraine that are Russian. Those, those were preconditions. But they were really interested, as far as the rest of Ukraine was concerned, in, in neutrality. They simply wanted Ukraine to be neutral and not part of NATO. And the Ukrainians were beginning to see, well, uh, perhaps we can come to some sort of solution. Well, we crushed that. We and the British collectively crushed any further interest in coming to any terms at all with the Russians. And if you listen to Biden and his public statements, if you listen to Lloyd Austin, if you listen to Tony Blinken, everyone is essentially taking the position that either you, Russia, unconditionally capitulate to our demands or the war goes on. Well, that's not going to happen. Russia's not going to capitulate unconditionally to anything we want. That's sort of like saying, you know, if you don't agree to evacuate New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas and Southern California, we Mexicans will fight you forever. <laughs> well, go ahead. You know, we're not capitulating and giving up New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Southern California. And that's the view in Russia. Forget it. We're, we're not doing business on those on those terms any longer.